Um, today, actually, as we announced, um, the, we invited uh, Professor Brad Evans here. Um, and our topic is on violence and then mostly uh, focusing on his recent book, um, Echo Humanitas. And uh, I'm gonna actually uh, give quite quick, you know, introduction of uh, Professor, you know, Brad Evans. He's, yeah, it doesn't need actually, you know, the a detailed uh, introduction because he's quite famous, you know, and then he published lots of books already. And then I think uh, he quite renowned, you know, scholar in this field. So uh, Brad is a political philosopher and a critical theorist and a writer and whose work specialized on the problem of violence. And I think he's actually the very expertise in the you know, violence study. And the author of 17 books and edited volumes along with over 100 academic media articles. And he currently holds a chair in political violence and aesthetics at the University of Bath, United Kingdom. So he actually published many books and then he contributed to the uh, many, you know, the newspaper and then, you know, the review, review actually, you know, the uh, journal. So including, uh, you know, London, uh, the Los Angeles uh, Review of Books and then New York Times. And he, you could find out that he is, you know, the work across the many medias. And then even actually he um, advised the television program and he also advised to Netflix, you know, I saw that, you know, the program. <laughs> So I, uh, so I, actually the uh, uh, keep keep actually big close to uh, applause to uh, you know the Brad and then I hope actually we had a very productive you know the discussion uh, through this session. Welcome aboard and then uh, um, actually um, the like you know the other you know our series actually we're gonna start um, very quick question to you know the. The Brad about his books and then so uh, actually uh, I think actually we're gonna start uh, with uh, his you know the talk about uh, very quick summary about his book or some you know recent you know research interest and then anything relevant to today's you know talk okay could you actually summarize and then could you actually introduce your book you know to uh, audience Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation as well, and it's great to be in such a great company with everybody, so I appreciate that. And um, also thanks for taking the time to read the book as well. I think it's, uh, I know it's, it's uh, quite a, a lengthy thing, so I think it's taken some time. Um, I guess the, the impetus for the book, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, actually goes back about um, a decade ago. And the what I was really concerned with at the time was I guess trying to make sense of, um, particularly um, in the history of Western forms of governance, um, this constant recourse to violence and how can we understand the, the constant idea that we are told that violence is inescapable in one way or another. So that was kind of the, this the starting impetus for me. And, and actually it was a book which was kind of initially so kind of conceived while I was spending some time in Florence and I was trying to make sense of the history of Western representations of violence if you walk on flocks, for instance, is just full of representations of violence. And trying to also make sense at the time about a decade ago, which was at the time when I guess, but well, he still is very important, but it was a time when everybody was reading Giorgio Agamben, and I was trying to really make sense of Agamben's work. I wanted to say something about violence, but kind of left in a kind of a position of inertia, because I think a gamble takes you to a place where you kind of say, well, he's dealt with the worst that the humans can deal with. What else is left to say about violence? But how can we do so also in a way which doesn't leave us kind of just lamenting how terrible the human condition is? Or leaving us feel like there's nothing we can do because humans are so kind of atrocious. And then try to connect that to the concept of humanity more broadly. Because the, what, the way I saw it was, the more we were kind of invoking this concept of humanity, the more we're willing to carry out violence in the plan. So how do we kind of make sense then of this? And for me, all this led me back to the work of René Girard. And René Girard's work on violence in the sacred. Um, but I was also very critical and or dubious of René Girard's position because for people like René Girard, he, found, he finds something meaningful and important 
in the concept of the sacred. The sacred is necessary for Girard because it allows us to regulate violence. You know, the sacred becomes this kind of excessive taboo which we need. So if we have sacred objects, we don't kind of get banish violence altogether, but we allow violence to become regulated and principled and moralized and so on. So I think that was the kind of start point of the leading question that I was initially trying to deal with when the book's inception arrived. But as the book developed, I also kind of realized that I also needed to account for a whole number of developments in terms of global affairs, not least what I've called in the book, the death of liberalism. And how do we now encounter, deal then with the changing historical nature of violence that connects with politics of the sacred onto the changing cartographies of global political power, not least the death of liberalism. So I think the book tries to bring those two together in a way in which I find my rescue through art. And I, and, I, and I believe that it's only through art and a more poetic concept of love can we actually find an escape meaningfully out of sacred violence and mm -hmm. liberalism, which I believe is another chapter in the history of religious violence. So that, I guess that's the kind of basic of the book. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a conversation we have. Yeah, actually the... the when I read your book and um, Brad, and then uh, one of the most powerful, you know, um, argument was, um, as you said, is kind of, you know, <clears throat> um, the the truth of the liberalism. You actually, you know, bring, uh, you know, that uh, liberal project, kind of, you know, many, um, you know, theorists like Foucault, you know, he actually pointed out uh, Liberalism, kind of in the theory of governmentality, is a, a, a very organized kind of relationship between between people and then administrative institution or something. You know, it's kind of it's a modern theory of you know the relationship between a people and then governance. And then, but actually, you revealed that kind of very theolo theological, you know, the aspect of the liberalism, you know. And then, uh, I think actually, I I what what I was you know. Uh, quite, uh, you know, the impressed is definitely you are, uh, you know, you actually, you know, uh, suggesting, you know, that, uh, you know, such a sacred, that means the theological moment of the sort of, you know, governance is so without that kind of, you know, the sacrifice and without, and that kind of, might be a very violent, you know, uh, the impo imp imposing, you know, imposing it onto that kind of people's, uh, the, how can I say it, it might be an ethical you know, decision or something, a very uh, inventionable kind of ethical, you know, institution. That is very interesting. So, uh, you know, the now that we uh, thought, you know, mostly actually the liberalism kind of rationalization is a rational political science, you know, and then, mm -hmm. uh, and then hopes as well, you know, you could find out the Levi the means kind of, you know, the, he tried to put, you know, the politics on, on the foundation of uh, mathematics is science, scientific, you know, foundation. Now uh, we are witnessing uh, that kind of statistic, you know, the, the public opinion, many actually that, that uh, numbers of that kind of statistic actually rule over the, this sort of governance or replacement of that kind of governance politics, as you said. So, uh, um, in this in this way actually you know the why actually you know the we uh you know got this sort of uh, you know liberalism you know the why actually still people believe liberalism kind of solution to but as you, as you argue that liberalism kind of you know based on this theological foundation not the scientific foundation mm -hmm. so actually could you actually elaborate this uh, your argument yeah well i think it's such an important question alex in, in the sense of you know I think one of the things I've always been kind of searching for is to try to say, okay, what is the singularity for liberal rule? Right? Because you know, we, we are, there's always this kind of way in which liberalism is like fascism, right? It's always capable of absolving itself yeah, yeah. by kind of saying, well, not we're liberals, but we're not that kind of liberal, right? So it's always like, you know, well, yes, there's the liberal wars and there's the wars on terror, but actually we're a different kind of liberals, right? So there's always this kind of self-absorption of liberals to kind of distance themselves from other liberals, which always kind of masks over what I think is the singularity to liberal rule. Now, I think, that, you know, you're right in terms of Foucault's relevance here is, is very important because I think only in so much as Foucault asks the simple question about, okay, what is liberalism at the level of power? All right, let's, let's take that analysis of liberalism away from its universal ideas about, you know, 
universal claims to right security justice, which pretty much every modernist project makes claim to in one way or another. And let's analyze liberalism at the level of power. Now, to me then, if we understand liberalism at the level of power, which I would argue begins with Immanuel Kant, right? So Immanuel Kant's ideas about, mm -hmm. and I think actually, if you look back in terms of the thinking of Immanuel Kant, Immanuel Kant, the reason why Kant is so important, and let's not forget that Kant ends his writing on the question of theology. Now, some people think this was a departure for Kant. I actually think it was a completion for his project, because what Kant is the first to do is basically moralize biopolitics. Mm. Kant is the very first to say that biopolitics is inseparable from the divine economy of life. Mm. Yet, yet the economy is a divine project for Immanuel Kant. Mm. Right? So, so from its inception, then liberalism has always been concerned with the divine governance of planetary life. Right? Mm. And this divine governance of planetary life brings together the political with the economic and as I say, it's there in the very earliest writings of liberalism. There's nothing hidden, there's nothing magical to it. But this is the way in which liberalism has always operated, or at least that's always been the ambition for liberalism from its inception, to govern planetary life. And I think that's, you know, Foucault recognizes this in the society must be defended. Mm. Just that. Now, but of course, the question of life is not a static problem. What we understand life to be is constantly changing and adapting especially through the technologization of life. And I think this, again, is where I agree with, actually, again, with Carl, you know, it's always dangerous to kind of agree with Carl Schmitt, because you know where his politics takes you. But Carl Schmitt is correct when he says that, actually, when you look at it at the level of power, liberalism is not very political at all. It's, it's, it governs through technologies of rule. And liberalism is very technologized in its governance. Now, what I wrote about in a book prior to the, the latest book, in a book called Resilient Life, The Art of Living Dangerously, which mm -hmm. I co-authored with Julius Reed, was that we argued that liberal subjectivity finds its final resting place in the resilient subject. So mm -hmm. post 9-11, liberalism is basically dominated by the paradigm of catastrophe. Catastrophe politics is what basically shapes the liberal problematic of security. It was always there, but catastrophe politics dominates liberalism. And this is a liberalism which also starts to increasingly lose faith in the idea, and the faith is an important word, I'll come back to this in a moment, but loses faith in the idea that it can govern planetary life. It becomes increasingly less able to do this. Where liberalism then finds it's almost like lasting resting place, is in this idea of resilience. The resilient subject now has to accept the injunction that life is fundamentally insecure by design. You have to basically just simply see catastrophes as learning process. You have to, which of course is completely bound up with the logics of neoliberalism as well, right? Mm -hmm. So there's liberalism and neoliberalism slip into each other. The resilient subject is a nihilistic subject. It's a subject which can only look at the world as a world in which catastrophe is inescapable, which crisis is inescapable. And in that sense, it gives itself over to this logic. And, and this is what we argued in the book, that liberal subjectivity has nowhere to go after, after resilience. It's, it's just wrapped up in this resilient subject. And of course, this was precisely the kind of way in which Donald Trump would kind of come in. And Trump would say, hang about, no, you're not insecure. You're not vulnerable. You know, you can be great again, right? So there was, it was almost like Donald Trump had read Judith Butler and was kind of mobilizing that, you know, you're, you're not ontologically vulnerable. You can be different to this, which of course is very appealing to a lot of people. And that's where, you know, contemporary fascist organizations have been very parasitic to this discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think that so there, there was something then in that crisis of liberalism when liberalism was no longer capable of galvanizing, galvanizing the political imagination, nobody wants to be told that the future is basically simply an endemic terrain of catastrophe and crisis. Mm -hmm. Resilience replaces resistance as a form of political subjectivity because you have to just accept the injunction that we are fundamentally insecure by design. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, well, what happens? And of course, the pandemic just destroyed. The pandemic, as I argue in the book, is the first global crisis of a post-liberal world, mm. a crisis in which liberalism has no answer. Liberalism mm. has no response to this, other than to simply say, 
be more resilient. What does that mean anymore? You know, so I think then the crisis has really exposed this. Now, I think, you know, I want to just end maybe on just a couple of years on Nietzsche's theory of catastrophe, which is very different to you know, the, the liberal conception of catastrophe. Mm. Nietzsche argues what's the real basis of catastrophe is when you are fundamentally exposed to the myths of the system of governance which is ruling you. So the catastrophe for the death of God was that humans suddenly realized, well, actually, how do we make sense of a world without this supreme being? Well, of course, we know Nietzsche was terrified about the death of God as much as he warned about it because he knew the kinds of violences which humans would create in the name of trying to become gods. I think the real catastrophe we are facing today is people have now been exposed to the fundamental myths of liberalism namely the myths about universality, universal rights, universal justice, which were all kind of broken apart already with the global war on terror, and are now being basically revealed for what it is, and that's basically a broken project. Mm -hmm. And the question that I then answer in the book, of course, is it's not about now whether liberalism is there or not, it's what comes after liberalism. And I think that's where we're in a new moment today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so who gonna, who gonna come next? Manoji, you you would have a question about. Yeah, yep. Uh, as a this is sort of a response to events that events book as well. Like I was trying to situate this book in the Indian context, basically the question of violence. Um, I was thinking about how to kind of address the question of violence as far as Indian society is concerned. So I was thinking about explicit and implicit violence that I can identify around me in terms of political violence, in terms of religious violence, in terms of other violences even. So uh, one of the most important point, like uh, Indians, one of the most important problem that Indian society is always faced with is the caste violence, basically. So the caste system, it has its own explicit modes of violence and implicit modes of violence also. And interestingly, I was, as he argues in his book, uh, citing Carl Smith, it is also connected to some sort of a metaphysical concept of what you call the sacred human. So you have the you have the concept of purity and pollution in terms of a which is identity which is explained by a metaphysical system of Indian philosophy or or the theological system. So the question of violence and sacredness. So what the other major major thing which I could like apart from the if you say caste wise oppressed the other other group of people which I could identify was, is, are, are the Muslims, basically. When you look at the, in the Indian context, you have the, the demolition of Babri Masjid, the mosque, in, uh, in the 90s. And then you have uh, Gujarat riots, which is completely orchestrated by the state. So you always have certain people identified. And violence as it is always orchestrated, it has a systemic, it's, it's also a systemic violence where in which state is directly involved in certain forms of political violence in, in completely eradicating one group of people from the, from the state or the implicit or the explicit form of caste violence where in which people are sort of like, you know. Uh, so my problem was basically, I was thinking about like whether I can find something out of the question, out of the sacredness problem, like why you need the conceptual category of sacredness always to explain the violence. What about like uh, something, what do you call, uh, I was trying very hard to kind of identify a major violence that occurred, which I was, I, which I think was not connected to any form of, form, form of theodicy in that sense. Mm -hmm. So while I'm, while I'm talking about you all, you're also talking about the, the connection between sacredness and violence, and you are extending to something of what you call technological theodicy, why you need always this theodicy as a conceptual category to explain the violence in terms of, so for example, if you, if you say a violence in a, polit in a campus again, amongst two, two groups of political ideologies, like, you know, that there is always, there is, there is after the violence, after the, after one person become the matter, then, then there is, something where in which you say he becomes a sacred, he's no more a profane activist anymore. He becomes a sacred activist. And then the rituals of all those kind of remembrance and all those things happens, even, even within what you call the communist parties. 
So the, the sacred, the becoming of sacredness is always there. But I'm very much puzzled with why you need always this, the concept of sacredness in order to explain violence. So if you can elaborate a little further on that, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, trying to answer this without navigating through the entire history of violence, I think, um, but I think it's a good, it's an important point, right? Because if we think back, you know, first of all, we are constantly told actually that if, you know, you walk into any natural history museum, right? That the history of the human condition is one of survival and violence, right? And, or at least we emerge out of these kind of survivalist paradigms in terms of very kind of early pre-modern humans and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, now, I think what's important if we think back in terms of, you know, prior, for instance, in the Western ideal to the, you know, the advent of ancient kind of Greece, sorry, indeed Christianity, if we think about the violence which is said to have taken place between hominids and other kind of early human forms, we attribute to that violence no political meaning or philosophical meaning whatsoever, right? It's just violence for survival, right? And the violence is not, has no metaphysics. Now we know this could be preposterous, anthropologically, historically, right? But the idea is that this is just humans killing one another because they have to survive, right? Now, with the advent, certainly, of, you know, the, the, the Greek ideas, particularly I mentioned in the book about, you know, the sacrifice of Iphigenia, which becomes this pivotal moment in the idea of the literary imagination that you have to sacrifice something for the greater good, right? Now, it's that ability to connect violence to some metaphysical notion of the greater good. Now, the greater good, of course, is always a projection. Right? The greater good always invokes a futurity, in fact, because the greater good is always a greater good to come. This you know, might get us to think back of Walter Benjamin's idea of the messianic, right? So, so there is something, therefore, integral to the idea of the greater good, which is always based on an idea of futurity. The greater good in the sacrifice of Iphigenia means that Agamemnon can win the Trojan War. So he sacrificed his daughter to appease the gods in order to win triumph, to secure his people. So the sacrifice of the daughter is better for the love of his people. So it's worthy of the sacrifice. And bear in mind, a sacrifice always has to be a worthy event. You, you know, you have to be worthy of the sacrifice, right? Because it, it, that's where the meaning comes in. Now, all demands for sacrifice impose a worthy value. You talk about communism, you know, if you sacrifice, the society will benefit, right? So, so there's a worthy value to the sacrifice, right? So it gives a kind of, you know, an intrinsic value to the order of the sacrificial. And this, I think, is a common theme throughout the history of violence then, that the history of violence, which takes place in the name of some greater good, so therefore it's always justified in the name of a sacred object, the name of the people, or the name of you know, the body of Christ or the, you know, the sacrifice for the military hero. All these things take place around and revolve around particular sacred objects. Now, the question then becomes, of course, you know, is how do you kind of break through this or break out of this? Well, you know, the question is, okay, how do we imagine maybe a form of metaphysics or a politics which doesn't demand this sacrifice? If you think about our, you know, con contemporary political vocabulary, it's so laden with the theological terms around atonement, redemption, sacrifice. You know, it's, it's, it filters every single day discussion. And you come on to the, the, the point you wanted, you talked about it in terms of, um, I think first of all, that there's an important point in terms of thinking this back in terms of Walter Benjamin again, you know, because Walter Benjamin, you know, it's, is, his most brilliant essay on critique of violence begins with a sentence, all violence brings us into moral relations. In other words, all violence raises the question of theology. <laughs> you know, violence begins with that question of theology, right? And the, our task, as Benjamin says, is to expose the different types of theologies which impress on the, on the body politic. Now, for Benjamin, of course, he was concerned with the distinction between the mythical and the divine. So Benjamin opens up a kind of a critical way into thinking about, you know, the mythical violence versus the divine violence in any given society. Now, the point which I make in this book is actually, we are now in a new age of politics, which also promises greater good, promises questions of redemption, promises questions of salvation, promises ideas through which violence will be justified for the greater good.
demands constant sacrifice. And this political order is what I've called the techno theodicy. It's a global system, which is a post-liberal system, which how many times do we, I, I think there's two, two things that are interesting to say, right? First of all, you cannot switch on the, the news channel in any Western country today without first of, them, of all using the word resilience. It happens every single day. The second thing is, whenever we're in an age today where globally we've never had the most incompetent set of politicians historically, right? Politicians seem completely incapable of dealing with any of the world's problems. Is this incidental to the accelerization in the intellectual power of technology? What we are told constantly today is only technology is going to save us. That is a theological proposition as much as it's a political proposition. We need to now have absolute faith in technology, especially, you know, in relation to the arts and humanities. Who needs the arts and humanities today? Man? What we need is STEM subjects. We need technology. We need the acceleration of technology because those are the only things that's going to save us. And yet any simple reading of history will know that technology is constantly bringing us to the point of annihilation. You know, just think, you know, I'm thinking about you, you know, somebody understood this better than anybody was Paul Klee. And I'm thinking of Paul Klee's Angel of History or the Twitter machine, you know. If there was, you know, if Klee, Klee serves as a warning to us, it's precisely about the ruination of technology, which has now become a theology in itself, which promises to save us and is invoking its own forms of violence. So I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> I kind of went on a yeah. bit of a detail. That is, a, that is a very interesting answer. So uh, I think uh, Hitomi, you would have any question about relevant to this? Um, what he just answered, or I have two different questions actually. That depends on you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you for the book. Um, it resonated a lot with um, many of the things I've been also thinking about because I teach about politics of history between Japan and its former victim victimized um, colonized states. And so I was reading your book more um, with attention about um, the issue of, well, what do we, how do we get people to respond? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to actually cultivate a kind of like a, you know, response from the, right, um, the viewer. And so I felt like uh, that there was a lot about the fleeting economy of attention to the violence is that it's right, ubiquitous in this world today. And how the sincere liberals, the more sincere they are, the more blind they are right, to their very complicity in the ways in which this is all being perpetuated. So there's a lot here in terms of the suspension of attention to violence and how there's a habit of looking away. Mm -hmm. And the repetitiveness and the scale of the violence also numbs the mind. And so the thing I was focusing on was when you mentioned about the politics of the visceral. And I was thinking about paper cuts. When I tell someone that I just got a paper cut, we kind of all like, right, like shirk because we can kind of identify with that. And the painting you discuss about the obscure beasts, I felt like that's thousands of paper cuts and how we kind of, right, have this response. And so I wanted to hear more about um, how you envision this politics as a visceral that right, tries to actually sustain this attention, which is always fleeting. Right? Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the image of the Aoyan, right, the, the boy that um, washed up on the shore, you say in page uh, 125 that here's a dilemma. Certain The optical for life, it seals over quickly. And the term seals over quickly made me think about well, what about scabs? You talk a lot about wounds, right? And there's a lot of things to associate with wounds. One is healing but there's scabs. And that was also the image that I associated with the image of obscure beasts, the paintings. 
there is something that's very fleshy, but also very raw. But mm -hmm. some parts and bits are drying, right? And mm -hmm. there's cuts on the surfaces and the skin is the biggest organ of the body, right? I mean, the largest surface. So how do we actually really take the politics of the visceral to think about suspension of, right? Um, to actually engage with this fleeting economy of attention? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, um, all uh, really great questions. Well, I, I think actually just um, you're taking the theories in your own direction in a way, which are yeah, um, it's really great to see, read you uh, see you uh, read it that way. I think the um, I think first of all to go back in terms of people who are unfamiliar maybe with the book. I think one of the things which I tried to make in the book is to argue that um, one of the defining characteristics of liberalism was the way in which it kind of, as you mentioned, like. Um, became kind of parasitic to victims. And, and in a way in which liberalism turns victims into sacred objects, and you see this happening slowly from the 1960s, but certainly from the 1980s onwards, there is this turn in liberalism alongside its kind of planetary ambitions to turn victims into sacred objects in order to expand the reach of liberalism. Because there's this kind of moment of you know, realization, I think, for liberalism that you know, left to their own devices, humans are not going to suddenly wake up tomorrow and say, hey, what? Well, I want to be a liberal. <laughs> it, it just, it didn't happen that way. So there wasn't some self-enlightened global awakening when everybody is suddenly a liberal waiting to just erupt. And I think that's why I think also the image of the woman in a burqa was such a potent symbol for liberals, because there was almost like, especially in the context of Afghanistan, it was almost like if we could liberate the, the, the women of the country and take off the burqa will sudden, suddenly reveal a liberal subject in waiting, right? who's just been always there waiting to be revealed. And I think the way in which liberalism became parasitic for the victim and turned victims into sacred objects was a way in which it would also justify this completely oxymoronic term called humanitarian war. You know, war carried out in the name of victims to create further victims. And we can think about ISIS in this context. Then you know, ISIS have became, you know, deeply violent victims of victims' wars, right? And there's this kind of con 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 continuity of the violence which carries out through this. Now, I think that's the one point, and I think you know, I certainly wasn't the first to, to say this, and kind of mentioned in the book, you know, the importance of Susan Sontag and Susan Sontag's kind of real concern with the ways in which images didn't have the impact we thought they should. You know, like Sontag says, you know, well, there's particular moments in history. You think, you, know, you think of the image of the napalm girl, Kim Cook, right? That should have ended the Vietnam War then, but it didn't. <laughs> you know, so these horrific images, actually, which don't have the impact that you expect they should. So I think that's, you know, one of the things we have to think about as, you know, as, um, as a society. You know, in terms of the visceral reactions, I think, you know, Maybe let's deal with the, 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 you know, what's changed also in the world today. Today, I, you know, I think you're right about the fleeting attention, and part of the issue that we face in the world today is this: we're now oversaturated by images and representations of violence, catastrophe, crisis, but remarkably, in a way where we don't see enough of the violence. Right? So, so every news channel is bombarded with stories of the latest catastrophe, the latest crisis. But actually, the images you see are very highly mediated. You know, you, you know, so you still don't actually see enough. You know, and this is again, I, I agree with Jack Ronsier. What Ronsier says, actually, we don't see enough of the visceral reality of violence. So it's still very highly mediated. But what we do know is, of course, is the more that we are oversaturated by narratives and stories of cat another catastrophe, another crisis, another, you know, is that we quickly shift our attention from one to the next in a way in which violence no longer appears exceptional, right? The, 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 there is no exceptionality anymore to any particular violent event. Now, I think about it, you know, and this is you know, this is a warning again, which Walter Benjamin says when he says, you know, the, the history of violence is a, is a history of the exception becoming the norm very quickly. You know, the exceptional invites critique it's much more difficult to criticize something which looks just terrifyingly normal to us. And I think that's, you know, the age we are in today. And, you know, um, 
give you another example, you, you think, for instance, you know, in an age prior to the oversaturation and representation of violence, we think about even like 30 years ago, the way in which the Holocaust would still constantly command our attention in terms of especially the Western kind of imagination. We're constantly, you know, and some might say it was over then, or we made sure that we didn't kind of look at the, you know, other forms of violence like global slave trade and so forth. Although I'm always dubious of people who try to make moral equivalence of different kinds of violence, because we should critique all forms of violence in its own terms. But what I do think was there was, you know, it stayed with us. The event was horrific and, and it stayed with us and we tried to make sense of it. We try, and we still try to make sense of it. We are tw we're, this September, we are two decades on from the, the horrific violence of 9-11. Nobody talks about it anymore. <laughs> It, it is kind of as if it's a, I couldn't have conceived of this when this violence was happening, that only two decades later, that it's seemingly gone. Nobody talks about it. Nobody, you know, and while I think Agamben was right to warn about the politics of the exception, we also need to retain something of the exception to violence. Otherwise, we just simply banish these things. And, and I think that's in the age in which we, so we're living in an age today then of a back to your point then about viscerality. And you're talking, I, I really like the, the use of the paper cut. Within an age today of a new politics of the digital vis visceral, which is actually fundamentally different from actual existing violence. You know? How many times do we see on social media today the collapsing between somebody who feels slightly offended between what somebody might have said on Twitter as opposed to the lived reality of violence which people experience? And, and I think that this is a dangerous terrain that we're in today in terms of, in which we're all now so ontologically vulnerable, so ontologically fragile, so ontologically insecure that we are incapable anymore of offering fundamental distinctions between the raw realities, as you talk about it, the raw reality of violence and the lived realities of actual existing violence, as opposed to a new digital economy of the visceral. Because this, again, I think is what is, you know, if you think about what is unique about technology today, technology in the 20th century needed humans but it just needed our raw human energy. It needed us to work the machines. Technology today harvests emotion. It thrives on emotion. It thrives on emotional harvesting. In other words, it's fully colonized the politics of the visceral and actually profits from it continuously. And I think that's where then, you know, and you, you talk about then the obscure beasts, Thing, which is you know, a series of paintings done by my wife. That work, I think, is really important because what it says, if we're going to try to find an escape through this, we have to touch into something far deeper within us. And that is something which gestures towards something more of the ancestral, something much more rich in the history of the human condition, which will allow us to develop a much more viable critique of this. Because the technologies we use, the logics, the violence are the same, Humans are visceral creatures, we shouldn't forget this, but it's the way in which the viscerality has now been colonized, I think, which is pushing us into a different order of politics. And this is something we need to be very alert to, especially when dealing with the raw reality of violence, and particularly the appropriation of victimization as well. Mm. All right, actually, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. talk. Uh, yeah. Um, mm, all right. So I got what you were saying, and it's uh, brilliant. Okay. So, uh, mm, but I was wondering when I read your book, why did you start off with the the Chapman brothers kind of introduction and their their art? Mm -hmm. And and uh, I was wondering how does how does it work uh, then? There. Graffiti is an act of violence uh, on the Goya etchings, right? So how do you... <laughs> how does it work then? Why, I was wondering why you, would, why you chose that particular art form, which I think is really puerile, actually. I mean, just 
because I, I, I actually just profoundly dislike their art. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it's a violent aesthetic, so I got it, right? But then, you know, violence, I was looking, uh, after that, I was thinking, okay, so I was looking for the idea of laughter uh, with violence and how that, and how that connects, because the Chapman's art is actually quite funny as well, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so I was thinking about, okay, so where, where is the, the laughter? And that, that took me to a place, well, Alfonso Lingis, the uh, translator of Levinas to Merleau Ponty, uh, does find, he too finds a kind of the laughter in that art form. We, we shouldn't be. We should be revolted by the, the mannequins and the, the ch ch uh, what it, what it, I forgot the, the name of the art, what it, what it's the, the child mannequins with the, the football, with the, the trainers on, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we should be kind of like, <laughs> We should say, no, this is wrong. I mean, this is really going beyond a certain point, but it is actually quite funny, right? So that makes us, mm -hmm. so I was thinking, okay, so is that, was that your point, the, the choice? Mm -hmm. was the, yeah. the choice of that art form was a kind of, okay, so we are, we, we see, as, as you said, a saturation of images constantly, right? And then we need this punctum, you know, because you talk about Sontag, right? Mm -hmm. So is that is that where the punctum is? Do we need that kind of graffiti, that defacement of something kind of pure or kind of sensible mm -hmm. and so on? Yeah. Okay. And and so then I, I've got mm -hmm. mm, all right. Yeah. So well, I'll actually answer this first, then I'll come on to the next question. I think there's so much to, again guess to open up here. So I think first of all, in terms of I, I, in the book, obviously I, I go through very different genres of art in terms of um, from the figurative to the abstract expressionist, and I think um, what each of those styles of art brings something different to the conversation. Now, in terms of, um, to me, you know, I, I really, I guess, like the, um, and I'm very taken by Jake and Dinos's approach to art in the sense of, for them, they want to produce art in which nothing can be redeemed, right? So that they, that they want to see how far they can push art in a way in which it destroys even the sacred object of art itself because there's a there's an inherent danger to what I, even I'm trying to do with this is try to say well I'm critiquing all this to arrive at a new theorization and this is something which I'm going to do in the next book with my wife on violence and abstract expressionism of trying to almost privilege the artist now and invoke a new kind of avant-garde kind of idealism of you know where the artist has a purer view of the world, because I think the danger is we then set up art itself as a new kind of sacred object, right? And then we say, well, what violence can now become done in the name of the artist and so on and so forth, which is already happening with technology anyway. Um, so I was always very much taken, first of all, by the intellectual project of the Chapman's. And the intellectual project of the Chapman's, as I see it, is an attempt to try to say, what does it mean to produce a work of art in which nothing can be redeemed, right? But of course, as the, Ch the Chapman say, capitalism is constantly redeeming them, right? It's, it's constantly trying to profit from them. It's, you know, they're producing things and they're thinking, how far can we push this stuff? You know, mannequins of children with penises for noses, surely this is gonna push the liberal sensibility too far. But no, they, they still kind of find ways to appropriate it and stick it in galleries and make money from it. And I think Jake and Dinos are really interested in seeing where this can go. Now, in terms of the, this, then, you know, you talk about the, the violence they bring to art. Um, I don't know whether I'd call it violence or not. I, um, I think it's creatively comic, like you say about, you know, buying Hitler's paintings and actually painting rainbows on them, right? So you buy Hitler's paintings and the Goya one as well. I, I come to the Goya point, but, but buying Hitler's paintings and then painting rainbows and, you know, almost childish scrolls, you kind of think, you know, and there's, a, there's actually a really great video where Jake explains what he's doing called Hitler turning in his grave. And he says, you know, it'd be easy for us to buy these things and destroy them. But this is actually a much better way of defacing the memory of this really mediocre art, right? So let's actually show how mediocre his work really was and let's just deface them and, you know, and also that in the point with Goya, you know, that their point was that Goya produced, you know, the, one of the points I make in the book is that modernity aesthetically begins with Goya, right? Goya paints the death of God, 
with the disasters of war series. This is the start point of the aesthetics of modernity. Now, we know, of course, Goya does the etchings because for him, he wanted them reprinted over and over to warn precisely of the disasters of war. They were the photographs of the time, right? And, and for Goya, he wanted that visual testimony. Now, when Jake was, you know, I spoke with Jake about what, you know, what, why they were doing this, for them, there was something there that we've forgotten this in Goya. You know, they're now kept in these lovely vaults of private collectors, so the world doesn't see the disaster of war. And they said, you know, it was only by kind of doing the work they did upon them, the people, especially in the UK, started talking about the importance of Goya again, in terms of, you know, the importance of rethinking the disasters of war series, because of course they had violated this sacred object of art. And I think there was something in that, which I think as a method, you know, it's not something you can repeat over and over and over, because once you've done it once, of course, the magic's kind of gone in that act. You know, but I do think that their work is very different just to painting a moustache of the Mona Lisa. I think that is much more of a method that actually takes time in that. Now, but I do recognize also, you know, for me, the importance of introducing Jake actually in the introduction. The start point with Jake as the introduction is actually less about the artwork than actually my respect for Jake as an intellectual thinker. I think, and I think the way in which Jake also in his writings is also trying to seek out something which is, goes beyond this question of the sacred. And that, of course, is all about tragedy. Now you talk about then, you know, the, the comedy value. And, and I think Jake's introduction talks about the importance of recognizing art as a comic tragedy. And I think, you know, and this is where I think also, the, you know, when, when I think of like the Chapman's, um, I think perhaps, you know, the, to me, the, the most compelling of all their works is Hell. And I think Hell is phenomenal. Um, but it, inv it invites so many comparisons with Dante. And Dante is a figure who is very much kind of, you know, runs right throughout the book. And we're coming up this September the, to the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. It's such a pivotal moment in the history of rethinking his relevance today. But Dante wrote it as a comedy, you know. It's a tragic comedy, the divine comedy itself, which hooked us into, of course, it's a serious book, but also plays back into the much broader dark comedy of the ancient Greeks in that tradition. And I think there is something then about the comic, which, you know, we need to retain in our politics. You know, comedians know the tragedy of history, right? You know, all the great comedians, you know, whether they think you can temporary, you know, temporary comedians such as Billy Connolly, you know, and all these people who can touch the human far better than most political theorists can ever do. Right? And, and, the power, and this is why I always pull my hair out when you see people on the radical left going after comedians. <laughs> this is the wrong target, right? You know, we need to have this transgressive value to comedy because comedy is deeply political. And especially, and, I, and I'm not saying, not all art should be comedy, right? But there's a place for it. And there is a, a resistive place for it in terms of rethinking the power of the imagination. And people might kind of counter back this and say, well, isn't, you know, wasn't Donald Trump a comedian or wasn't Boris Johnson a comedian? I'd say, no, they're not comedians, they're clowns. And, you know, and if every, you know, child, children are fearful of clowns because we know clowns take great delight in persecuting people who are vulnerable, right? The clown will always pick it out and identify somebody. They'll play the clown, but their violence is calculated. That's different to comedy. And I think that there is something then different at stake there. So I don't know if that answers your first question, John. But... Well, I I, uh, I know their work because um, uh, I've been a student of Nick Land for a, a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, they collaborated in the 1990s, okay? Mm -hmm. And of course, Nick Land has his, his, his book is not very good, his Bataille book, right? But he was, he was there writing on Bataille, which you, you talk about uh, mm -hmm. Bataille, but not his work as such. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it, it confused me because you started talking about Chapman, but then Land was absent from, from, from the book. And then you, you just said that Chap the Chapmans have a kind of, uh, you mentioned the word moral. So it, this idea that the, the, we should remember and then Goyo, the reproduction of the, the etchings was to remember, but now we somehow that has been erased. And then mm -hmm. 
the Chapmans are there to remind us that we, we should remember, right? So there is a kind mm -hmm. of moral moment there. But Nick Land, there's none of that in Nick Land's work. Mm -hmm. Nick Land is, a, is, you know, is an immoral philosopher, absolutely, right? Mm -hmm. Materialist through and through. I mean, he says that uh, art, the artists are the wild beasts of the impersonal, right? Mm -hmm. so, so is that not... I was wondering why the absence of it, uh, of his work, I mean, just, just you know, mm -hmm. that, from yeah. my own kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I, I guess I never really got too much from the Bataille book, and I, and I think the... I, I agree with you. Um, I don't necessarily... Um, accept that remembrance is moral. So I, I don't think that just because you remember something, it's moral. I think it might invoke a certain ethics. Um, and I think it's not, you know, I, I, I'm kind of reminded of it here by, there's a brilliant chapter in the reprint of um, Zygmunt Bauman's book, Modernity and the Holocaust, where he says, we have a duty to remember, but what, right? And it's not just remembrance, but it's how we remember and how we bring that remembrance into the contemporary period. Now, I think, you know, where, um, where the Chapmans do something very interesting in the context, for instance, you know, Jake was always saying, you know, people are saying to me, well, you know, that you um, have this kind of remembrance, for instance, of the Holocaust, right? And, he's, and, and people took a front at hell saying, oh, you're fucked in from the Holocaust. And he said, no, what we are actually doing is a Holocaust of Nazis, right? All the victims in their, in their work are Nazis. So he's saying, well, actually, it's, it's not about the Holocaust at all. It's about, it's a different project and it's a different idea. And I think, you know, the art at its best allows us to reimagine not historical atrocities, but the ways in which it makes a demand on the contemporary. Um, now, maybe with Nick Land, I think maybe the, the suspicion I had maybe was perhaps because it was too much like the tide. And I think the tide for me, I, you know, I, I've got a lot from Bataille's readings, and I, you know, I, I like the the sense of the horror in Bataille. I like the way in which, you know, Tears of Eros is such a phenomenal book, right? Um, I profoundly disagree with him in the question of the absence of myth, because I I think that Bataille's theorization that you know we entered into a period where myth was absent to me just simply didn't correspond whatsoever. But I also think that Bataille is incapable of seeing beyond the sacrificial. And actually, he takes the sacrificial to the nth degree. So perhaps my suspicious that land also became a kind of, well, is he just trying to sacrifice art in a way that becomes the same way in which Bataille tries to sacrifice the sacred, but simply can't need it. So, and as much as my suspicions with Nietzsche, because Nietzsche is incapable of going beyond good and evil either. You know, I write about this in the final chapter. I don't think Nietzsche goes far enough. I think Nietzsche is still bound up with the sacred. He can't kind of escape it. So, so I think that to me is an also an interesting question to be raised. And and then, you know, can we escape the sacred? I don't I don't know. This is this is a question I still have dangling. I hope we can, but I, I, it's still a question that I I still don't know. It's it's often not a question that one person is ever going to resolve by themselves. Mm. So, Walter, back to your the uh, talk about you know the the comedian. The comedian is quite political, and that's why you uh, you you did a uh, collaboration with uh, Jimmy Carr. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like participate well, in the TV TV comedian show. Yeah, but well, I find more with you know more with Russell Brand really. I think I think Russell is, but I think Russell's great in terms of actually showing the way in which a comedian can touch the human side of people far greater than any politician or any political theorist armed with the moral truth. Right? Because most comedians, you know, most comedians who come across as genuine and authentic have been and know the dark side of human existence, have really hit rock bottom, right? And, you know, and, and also, you know, some of the people then, who's, you know, I think of like Samuel Beckett, you read Beckett, right? You know, and I've recently been going through again, Ill Seen, Ill Said, which is such a brilliant mediation on the void. It's so comic. It's, there's so much comedy in Beckett. And people kind of read him as very dark. But I think that, you know, some of the best commentators on history, Dante included, he's a comedian. That There's comedy there in, in the horror. And I think, you know, that's one way we have to find a way through this is, you know, is to find, you know, and this is again where Nietzsche does come in, you know, or at least Deleuze's reading of Nietzsche 
about we need to find joy in philosophy mm. because there's too much lamentation and moral sanctimoniousness that's taken over from us today. All right. I think uh, Chumei would have, you know, then more question. And then uh, anyway, actually, then relevant to uh, what we discussed uh, was some uh, new question. Yeah. Always maybe it's so human, maybe too human <laughs> for me. Because Alex knows that I have become so used to read anything about anything but humans. <laughs> so humanity, you talk about humanity and that puzzles me. I mean, what is humanity? At some point, I almost feel that humanity is, is, is a religious concept. You know, it, it's uh, more metaphysical than, well, it's not a scientific concept. Uh, although may, maybe, um, yeah, we are also critical of science, of course, but I do believe, um, I want to, um, yeah, I believe your warning uh, uh, about the liberal incorporation of a planetary life is, is timely, that's important, that's necessary. But the way you talk about the planetary, especially planetary life, really kind of troubles me because it's like, it almost, let's say, if, oh, oh, it is, I don't know. For you, that um, planetary life it is no more than a, a, a narrative of sacred victims that legitimizes the liberal intervention and violence. And that troubles me. Yeah, and because I would like to, and I have been thinking about Maybe it's possible for us to, to, to come up with or to, to think about a version of a planetary politics that is uh, not, or, or, or maybe as far as possible away from that liberal models that we have been criti criticizing. But also the way you talk about liberalism, sometimes you use liberalism as the, the subject, <laughs> like liberalism's ambitions, right? Liberalism's globalist project. So it's the subject for you. So that also troubles me. So what is liberalism? liberalism? I don't know anymore. No, yeah. it, it's, I, I get lost sometimes in the way you talk about all these terms. Yeah. So my question, to be precise, is really about planetary politics. Is it possible for you that we can think about a version of this planetary? For, for me, that, that would have to be multi-species in, in some way. Mm -hmm. You know, we cannot just talk about humans. And uh, actually, humans are not humans anymore. I mean, um, we are like for example, in terms of genomes, uh, we are maybe 8% of our genomes is uh, viral gene sequences and 1.5% is uh, uh, Neanderthal. Mm. Oh, good. So good thing is we are more viral <laughs> than <laughs> Neanderthal. Okay, so my question is about planetary politics. How do you think about that? Thank okay. Okay, oh, oh, very important points. Uh, the, first of all, the um, planetary life. Okay, first of all, you said, what is liberalism? I would rephrase and say, what was liberalism? Because I argued that liberalism is dead, right? So, but we can come back to that point in a minute. Planetary life. Um, no, I, I, I use the term planetary life. I actually, as I mentioned, I, I invoked that term actually in a, the previous book on resilient life, planetary life. Um, I'm deeply troubled by the concept of planetary life because I think it relates to a global regime of power. Now, Foucault is right to say that life doesn't exist until the 18th century. What does he mean by that? Well, he means life which is absorbed and created by the life sciences. 
So life had no reason to exist prior to the 18th century. Life gets invented as a political problem. Prior to that, we talk about humans. After that, we talk about life, right? So, so life is not a, a biological fact of being. Life is not something which is a self-evident thing. Life emerges as a political problem in a Foucauldian sense. Now, I would argue that from the 1970s onwards, you will not hear any liberal political theorists, certainly no liberal international agency, talk about anything other than planetary life. It talks about global security, global peace, global justice, all of which have a totalizing understanding of a unified human species in one way or another, which you see this in, especially in the field of human development from the 1990s on. You know, the United Nations Development Project is a big advocate of this idea of planetary life, right? Which becomes increasingly a global imperative post of 9-11. Why? Because what happens in the most remote cave of Tora Bora can have a devastating impact on New York City. So planetary life becomes a problem, undoubtedly post 9-11, but it was already there prior to this, right? for liberal societies. Now, the point I also want to point out is, you know, when I talk about liberalism or when I, when I was talking about liberalism, of course, we are not talking about the world. We are talking about a very small aspect of the world, actually, in terms of the number of people who would self-identify as liberals, the number of people who which liberalism claims to be currently operating over, but it doesn't matter. What matters is the global ambitions of the ways in which liberals saw and related to the world and, and the unequal relation of power those people had as a vis-a-vis -vis other political projects. Now, in terms of then the question of humanity, absolutely humanity appears as a religious concept, right? Especially the way humanity appears in the 17th, 18th century. Although, of course, we have to also recognize that you know, whilst there is a very profoundly theological conceptualization of humanity, which appears especially, for instance, in Immanuel Kant's Great Beyond Perpetual Peace, which is a very much a kind of a theological doctrine as much as anything else, there is, of course, a different strand of the human which goes contra Nietzsche, right? So, you know, Nietzsche said human all too human, you know, which leads us into an anti-humanism humanity that we might like kind of work with the language there. Um, now, your point then at the end, I'm deeply troubled by this idea that there's nothing unique to human life, right? This idea, first of all, you find this in the doctrine of resilience, right? The doctrine of resilience, first of all, says, well, actually, humans are really no different to plants or weeds. You look at the way in which we operate, we're exactly the same as the biosphere. So actually, human life is no different to plant life or any other form of life or Human life is just simply made up of all these microbes, so there's nothing unique to the human existence. We are, you know, this is something which is also then picked up by post-humanists or the transhumanists and say, well, actually, we're just data, really, right? So what, what are you getting so, you know, head up about? There's nothing unique to the human life, the human species. You're just complex data, so just give yourself over to the machine and your bodies don't matter in your life. I think my matter. question is, why do we keep talking about humanity when it is... Yeah, so but I, I, yeah, I, I, I think no, it's a good point, but I think that to me, we have to keep hold of something of the exceptionality of being human. I'm not saying to make the human something as a hierarchical species amongst other species. Yeah, but I do think that being human is important. I do think that say, saying that there is something about human life is important to us in all its multiple forms, right? I, I think if we simply collapse the human into all other life forms, or all other non-life forms, then we so end up it is possible to think about to talk about a non-human or more than human multi-species planetary politics. Yes, of course. It's possible to talk yeah, about of course, of course, yeah, of course there is. But, but what, what I'd say is that there is there is something, you know. I ended the, the, the chapter in the book Resilient Life, the chapter is actually called More Than Human. Right? So when we talk about the need. But more than human is not a technology, right? So to be more than human is not some post-humanist dream or transhumanist dream. 
where we can become more than human because we are simply kind of attuned to, you know, and I think this comes back to Tony's point earlier about the viscerality, right? I'm also deeply skeptical of this idea that the closer we get to the body, the closer we get to theory. I think we actually work in the opposite way. I think we are constantly multiplying ourselves in a way in which we are constantly abstract subjects in the making. We are constantly exploding ourselves into different worlds, into different subjectivities, different identities. But it doesn't mean to say that being human doesn't matter. Maybe I'm being all too Nietzschean here in my mm. politics. But I still think that, you know, the idea that we can think of multi-species life, of course, that's important. And of course, we have to recognize that if we kind of start romanticizing the human again, like we did in the, in the 18th century and the Romantics movement, once again, we could put the human as the center of the universe and the human is all that matters and the human is the hierarchical species, which is the last thing we want to do. But I still think that retaining something of the human, even in a multi-species paradigm, and say that being human is exceptional, as much as being an ant is exceptional, or being any form of species is exceptional, I think is important because otherwise we lose sight of, and I, I, this is an important point, right? Only humans are capable of being artists. That's my point. Mm, Chof, do you have uh, some add-on? Chof. Well, could you ever might have some issues with that idea, but never mind. But uh, my point is, I, I want to continue what uh, Tungme was talking about, uh, because it occurred to me uh, that when, right at the beginning of our discussion, something cropped up in my mind, so I wanted to to think about it. And then you were talking about theology, right? And you were talking about um, about the prehistoric kind of uh, prehistoric, uh, you know, the prehistoric man, right? Mm. It kind of, it troubled me that, you see, because, and you, you mentioned that there's, that it's not a metaphysical uh, issue. And I think it is because, well, it, it's metaphysical to the extent that I was thinking about technology right when thinking technology connected to violence and i think i think there's an ontological choice when we use uh, techniques we choose whether it's the bone to to kill another human being or an animal or it's to use it to i don't know to make a, a, a house or something like that so anyway that that got me thinking okay whether the violence is it is it a supplement to the human or is it an excess to the human? What is, it, is its nature? Or is it in, in, inherently present, always present in the human? And then you talked about Kant, so it, it kind of threw me. You know, Kant has a theory of religion, I know this. Um, and he also talks about the parasite being, uh, he has a theory of the parasite, which he goes back to Chung Mei's point that humans aren't just some kind of abstract kind of, kind of, you know, like a uni kind of unistructural thing it's invaded by all kinds of other things and his theory of the parasite says that evil as such is is parasitical it's part of the the human being so anyway this got me thinking okay this got me thinking whether the violence is that is violence parasitic to the human is it what what, what do you mean by that is it a supplement or is it internal to the human as such and then that. All of that brought me back to Stiegler, you see, because then right at the beginning, you're discussing the prehistoric man. Then I think Lukács talks about the ontological choice with, with what, when we choose a tool, how we use a tool, right? Uh, that would need unpacking, but that led me to the idea of pharmacology and the idea of techne. So I guess whether techne is a, violence is a kind of a poison or a cure, that kind of idea, or it's a supplement, right? Or it's or it's parasitic. So I, I'm not sure which one it is from, from that question that came out there, but I wonder if you could shed light on that idea. <laughs> okay. So when you were talking there, I was kind of thinking, first of all, about um, that the brilliant opening scene for 2001. Space. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes. Right. So, um, and the, the ways in which those, you know, the apes get together and there's this, you know, profound moment. And, now, the one picks up this, the bone and he realizes that he's got a weapon, right? And he realizes actually that he can probably dominate the other apes through this 
Um, now, that act of domination in itself. Now, I think it's interesting to think about in that sequence alone, where does metaphysics make it out? <laughs> because I think in, in, in terms of, um, is there some, you know, I don't, I think first of all, maybe we need to be careful to say that all ontology is metaphysical. Um, and I think, you know, the, the ape picking up the bone and deciding to hit the other ape, you know, and realizing that he, he has a weapon. Is that an ontological choice? Yes, right. But does metaphysical politics make its entry in that moment of impact? Because I think the metaphysics arrives in the ending of the scene where the tablet arrives. And they think that actually there may be something more to this right. existence than simply the hitting of the other ape with the bow, right? So um, I'm open to be challenged on that, but I, I think for me then, you know, the, I, 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 so, think so, tech, I think techni is first philosophy. That's my, my position. Uh -huh, see, I, so I think I, philosophy begins poetically. So I think that that's, mm. yeah. So I, I think the, so I think the, the, that would be what I would challenge that. Um, now in terms of the violence, I think both, Violence is both an excess and also a parasite. So I think violence as a metaphysical demand, right? Now, we can talk about violence as being something which is, first of all, I'm troubled, first of all, by this idea that violence is something which is simply innate to the human species. Right? Mm -hmm. Because actually, I think violence doesn't come easy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, the opposite, actually. I think humans find it very difficult to engage in physical violence upon one another. We find it easy to press buttons and drop bombs, which we don't see the violence. So we find it easy to shoot people at a distance, but actually killing people close up, I think, don't come easy, doesn't come easy to do. Mm -hmm. so, I, 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 so I'm troubled by a certain innateness of violence. But I do think that violence is a potentiality in, in, in that sense. Um, we could argue that perhaps given all the shit that humans go through, the question might be, why are we not more violent? Right? because actually we have a remarkable capacity to moderate our violence. Now, in terms of the excess, I think the excess is the metaphysical demand. No. The metaphysical demand that violence places upon us and demands us to constantly replenish it. And that's where the sacred comes in. So I think then in that sense, I think the, um, what for me then, the, there might be an ontology to violence which predates a metaphysics maybe, but there's certainly, um, an excessiveness to violence, which is how violence can constantly replenish itself through a narrative of the sacred. And I think that's, you know, and you, you talk about then Kant's theory of evil, you know. Right. Um, it's one of the most formidable concepts of evil we have, I think. People underestimate how important I think Kant's conception of evil is and this radical understanding of evil, you know. And yeah. there's a brilliant book by, I don't know if you've read, by um, George Mickelson Jr. called Fallen Freedom. Kant's theory of the radical conception of evil. And what basically he says is that Kant sets in place the moral injuncture that life is forever guilty of its own unmaking. We are always guilty of our own fall, right? It's a constant, it's a reworking of the biblical idea of the fall, where we always have to atone for our sins constantly. Right. But mm. the evil is within us. It's always mm. the potentiality within us. And that's the danger of Kant's parasite. You know, it's... Evil is not an excess anymore. No. We are, you know, we are evil through the actions that we do. And, you know, it's something which also, I, I think, you know, um, I think in a treatment, and you know, I mentioned her work briefly in the book, but maybe I could have elaborated much more on this, was um, Simona Forti's book, New Demons. And mm -hmm. Simona Forti really deals with this in a really great way as well, in terms of, you know, what she called mediocre evil, as opposed to, you know, mm -hmm. and she tried to depart from Kant's radical evil in this. So I think mm -hmm. it's it's an important point to to recognise the to me what troubles me is it's, it's too easy sometimes to say well humans are just naturally violent rather mm -hmm. than focus on the excess of violence the, the, mm -hmm. and the demand of violence constantly places upon us as humans. So if you allow me a kind add something on it, uh, the back to uh, that you know postmodern issue and the post post human issue. Uh, what I mean, so. Um, I think as far as I understand, you know, what uh, the brother said, you know, the, if I actually um, the, bring that, you know, the issue into my own, you know, terminology, I think that uh, when you talk about actually, you know, human being or some kind of humanity uh, must be understood kind of, you know, metaphysical politics is like Aristotle's, you know, 
conceptualization of human is that means uh, human being is a uh, you know political being political animal so uh, human being as a political animal that means uh, i think politics is a very actually you know the very singular you know the idiosyncratic you know the um the um, feature of a human being you know if we uh, question what is human being that is a political animal that i think that you know the conceptualization is still uh, you know the very uh, efficient to uh, define what the uh, actual human being is and then so uh, uh, that's why just i think actually you know post humanism is not really actually political is i think actually that is there might be a very good theory you know theoretical you know explanation of what we uh, have at the moment but uh, very descriptive, you know, it's, it doesn't actually give any, you know, me metaphysical, um, you know, um, discourse and then any metaphysical framework, you know, onto, uh, you know, the uh, re redefinition of, uh, or, you know, the, um, the, the, how can I say just a little bit, actually the, uh, um, the production of the kind of a new politics. So, uh, because, you know, the, um, what I mean, you know, the, you know, um, in, in you know the society control the essay and uh, Deleuze said you know the society control uh, control society and then uh, um, you know the what uh, he tried to say, the say actually by that is the control uh, I think actually he said you know the individual is no longer possible that means uh, already actually human being that means individual is uh, turned to be a individual that means actually you know, I think that might be an overlap, you know, the what uh, Brad said, you know, end of the liberalism, because the liberalism is definitely is rely on that, you know, foundation of the individual, but the individual no longer, you know, possible. That means, you know, the actual di the individual and the, how actually the individual could be, uh, you know, individual, that means uh, actually you said is a data and then, you know, many mechanical actually, you know, the distribution of that kind of sensation. And then those actually, you know, the technology and to deconstruct, you know, destruct, you know, the individual. And then uh, it actually, you know, the cause many, you know, this kind of political, you know, effect in particular, you know, end of, you know, the liberalism or some post-liberal, liberal, you know, situation. So in this way, actually, the, the, what uh, we have at the moment is, uh, that means uh, um, whatever I call this post-humanism and that uh, we, okay, just we uh, should, you know, bring in kind of a planetary politics against that sort of, you know, the post-liberal, you know, situation. But how can we actually build up the new metaphysic of, you know, this uh, technological situation? That means the so-called post-human, you know, situation. So uh, if I actually allow me to use my own, you know, term. So um, what do you think about this, you know, the violent situation? Okay, the violence, you know, the come up with this sort of, you know, technological, you know, apparatuses and then uh, all this, you know, the, um, the the surveillance mechanical surveillance you know destroy the human being and then humanity in in Badius, you know Alan Badius term in you know, humanity is a kind of metaphysic you know of that sort of you know the planetary politics and then we always the think about the humanity otherwise we cannot produce you know the politics you know and then so actually what we need is a definite metaphysic new metaphysic of this you know the the post politics you know, the, or post-political, you know, the, the world. So uh, could you actually, you know, give us, you know, kind of a, the, the idea about this metaphysic, yeah. something, you know? If, if, if I start with this question of uh, this whole political animality, I, I think um, yeah. the reason why I'm troubled with post-humanism is I still don't think we really know what it means to be human, <laughs> let alone be post-human. And I think some of the early impetus in the movement in post-humanism, I thought was great in the sense of which, you know, and I'm thinking of some of the, you know, particularly the earlier stuff of Donna Haraway and Catherine Hales, who are actually deeply troubled by the encroachment of technology in human life. And I, and I think that there is there is something in that early kind of concerns, which I think are um, important, but it seems like post-humanism really opened itself up and tried to run with um, the fetish of connectivity, right? So I, I think there's a, there's a fetishization with connectivity today in which everything is now connected and everything has a connectivity to it. And actually connectivity becomes a linear, flattening, you know, terrain of endemic possibility 
Whereas we know as humans, some connections matter more than others. It's not about having connectivity with everything, right? What matters is the types of connectivities we have. And often it's better to have a small selection of connectivities with people who are really meaningful, but connect with the entire world because of whatever, right? So, so I think actually this fetishization in post-humanism with connectivity, I find deeply troubling actually, because it lends itself again into a particular order for politics. Now, Deleuze's control society, of course, is you know, it's such a phenomenally important essay. And the way in which, and um, although interestingly, it's you know, kind of a bit of the tyranny of the author, you know, it, it's actually Guattari's concept. And everybody kind of talks about it as Deleuze's. And I think, you know, just to give a bit of a nod to Guattari in that sense, I think there's, you know, we need to recognize the importance of Guattari. And even Deleuze recognizes that, that essay, right? He says, as Guattari called the control society. So I, I think there's, you know, there's something worth, did you want to come in, John? Sorry. No, actually, Paul Virilio insists it's his concept. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, I know that actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and actually, in um, I think in the I think there's a footnote in a thousand plateaus where they acknowledge Virilio's work and everything. But certainly, if you read Speed and Politics, you know it's already there. Yeah. So and and actually, I, I agree. I, I know Jock, you talked about Stengler earlier, but we can't, you know, even begin to investigate contemporary politics without Virilio. And one of the persons who I think should have featured us more in the book is Virilio than what he does, actually. Um, but that's maybe a conversation for another time. But I, I certainly think, you know, this idea of the digital individual, which they identify in controlled societies is very important. But you kind of think in terms of, you know, even, you know, the way in which they kind of map out, you know, it's kind of, you know, the interesting thing I find about controlled societies now is almost like a way in which Deleuze himself is starting to recognize the limits of his own theory of nomadology. That nomadology in itself might not be enough. Right? That, you know, just to be nomadic, well, controlled societies is now catching up with you. And controlled societies were saying to you, well, actually be nomads, right? Be nomadic, you know, forego, you know, all these kind of, you know, this, this idea of spaces, of fixity, of rigidness, you know, open yourselves up to mobility, movement, and so on and so forth, right? as long as we know we can control it, right? So, you know, and, and in that sense, I think Zygmunt Bauman's idea of borders as being asymmetric membranes is really useful. You know, that it's porous enough to allow some forms of movement completely rigid to block others, right? So I think there's something in that. But I, I think in terms of then the question of metaphysics, I think it's such a crucial question for our times in terms of, you know, what does metaphysics look like today? Right? Or, or can we even conceive of a metaphysics today in an age so dominated by technology? Right? What, does, what does it mean to have a metaphysics in this age where we are told that the future can be calculated by a machine? Right? Where, you know, where the machines do the metaphysics for you, right? in, in that sense. And I, and I think then this is where, you know, not only must we go back perhaps to, you know, Virilio, but we, Martin Heidegger is so indispensable, today, right? And, and I think particularly, you know, back to the point with Jock earlier, the distinction Heidegger draws between politics. I still think we, we, we are yet to really understand, I think, the significance of this in terms of where we are in, in this contemporary moment. And the fetishization of connectivity, the fetishization, the belief now in which you know, technology is now promising to do the metaphysics for us. And I think this then becomes the challenge for humans in the 21st century is how can we conceive of a metaphysics, which is, you know, Deleuze talks about the aim of philosophy is becoming, you know, worthy of the event, right? I think we need to go further. Than that. We need to devise, you know, it's not just about imminent moments. It's not just about, you know, philosophy has been worthy of the event but about the imminence. Because power is now imminent, right? Power is now imminent, digital technologies are now imminent. We need a different problematic. I don't necessarily know if I have that formulated clear enough, but certainly your question is a good place to start with in terms of what does a metaphysics look like in this contemporary moment? Because we know it's sorely needed and we know that it's constantly under attack by the fetishization, the technologization of the world. Yeah, yeah. So actually, it's uh, no longer actually metaphysical, but anyway, we need that kind of primordial, primordial actually, you know, 
Well, the ancestral, I think, I think there's something yeah, yeah. in the ancestral, you know, and, and I think, you know, the, the, there's something we need to, you know, there was, um, there's some interesting work done on this, particularly by Lewis Gordon, who talks about the importance of the ancestral in terms of, you know, Africana phenomenology, for instance. But I think that there's something that we need to tap into, you know, and I, but which is why I, in, in the book, I'm kind of taken by the artwork of Anna Mendieta as well. You know, I think her work really gestures towards the ancestral. And I think, it, and it's, again, it's not kind of trying to create a kind of a romanticism of, around primitive ways of living, so-called primitive, but it's to try to excavate much deeper questions about the history of the human condition and some of the fallible assumptions around which we kind of, you know, narrate the history of the human condition as well. Hmm. So any more? Shall I have a? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a disagreement <laughs> here, especially in the context of post humanism. It's like, uh, I think post humanism raises a philosophical problem. It's, it's, it raises certain issues. You're talking about the planetary crisis, do you say, post pandemic or during the pandemic or something. So, where we, where we, like, in one way, it is like becoming more of a surveillance society where the whole political body is becoming a criminal body. We are all under surveillance of something, some sort of that stuff, of course, with that technological thing. But the, how, do, how do you kind of encounter the crisis that uh, the pandemic puts forth? Like, you know, in terms of, uh, so that is where I think the concept of post-humanism or the limitation of the concept of human in that sense, which if you are, if you are, if you are kind of critiquing the modernism, modernity, for that matter, in Foucault also, like in the order of things, he brings in the concept of like what he calls the analytic of the finitude, mm -hmm. like which becomes the central axis of the modern episteme even to emerge, which is like which is basically the Kantian framework, where where he where he where he precisely comes up with the the limitations of the human, the concept of the human, the human as a as a, as a concept emerges in the human sciences where in which you have the life, language, and labor comes together, political economy, biology, and language, right? Coming together as in, in the modern episteme. And he brings, he also says that, like he, he, the analysis of, analysis ends with the fragility of the concept of the human there, like the construct, the construct of the human there. Mm -hmm. So while we are addressing the, the new, new crisis, like, I not I'm not elaborating on why it's like you know if you can go to the order of things and see how why he says that he identifies a couple of reasons for that philosophically not like in terms of you say human as the liberal human identified as as European male that sort of I'm not referring to that sort of cultural criticism but philosophically that construct becomes uh, very fragile. Mm -hmm. So that after that, like, you know, when you are addressing this, this crisis, when you, when you try to kind of come up with a resolution or try to address this new problem, especially with the pandemic, where you are encountering the problem of life, life in, not in a biopolitics, but in a biopolitics in a different sense, you encounter the real problem of life, you encounter other life, not known life, right? Where in which you 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 have a multi, multiple lives around you, mm -hmm. where in which where you situate humanism, or when you when you come up with a new metaphysics or rejuvenating the idea of human being human, I'm I have my own doubts there. I just stop there. I am um, well. I don't know. Maybe you could elaborate more why you think post-humanism has a monopoly over the idea of the multiplicity of life. Because I don't think it does. I think I, I think the um, now I, I, I get I get the points on um, Foucault's connection with Kant, and actually I think Foucault's often too too Kantian for his own good sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know I'm deeply troubled by that essay. What is enlightenment, right? So I, I I think actually he has too much of an allegiance to Kant sometimes, and actually you know the the, the and I much prefer like Deleuze and Guattari's you know, taken a part of Kant in particularly A Thousand Plateaus, where they, you know, which is something which is picked up by Hart and Nagy as well. And I think, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm some, and I'm also sometimes troubled also by the way you talk like with Foucault. I think sometimes, you know, I think we owe a great intellectual debt to Foucault for talking about 
the separation between the human and life as political categories. But then I think sometimes he collapses the two again when it suits him philosophically. So, so I, I think that's what I'm kind of a bit troubled by that as well. So there's, um, so I, I think in Foucault there is a notable distinction between life, uh, between the human as a, you know, as, as a, as a philosophical body that's capable of, of thinking and life as a political problem which is wrapped up in the life sciences. But then sometimes you can collapse the two. So um, no, you know, I'm sure you know, the more puritanical Foucauldian scholars will say, you know, we told you so, forget biopolitics, right? So I, 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 so I think that there's something in that which I think is perhaps worth excavating. But I think the trouble I have is that we need to be post-human in order to recognize the multiplicity of life, because I don't think that's necessarily the case, right? Because I think there was no better theorist on the multiplicity of life than Nietzsche. You know, Deleuze's book on Nietzsche is all about multiplicity. It doesn't mention one's post-humanism. It doesn't need to. Right? So now you could say, well, post-humanism grows out of this tradition. Okay, all well and good. But I still don't think that you need that theory in order to arrive. Right? So um, now the question of the pandemic, okay, you know, has the pandemic forced humans to recognize, you know what, we're not on this planet alone? Well, you know, it doesn't take, you know, anybody in the remote sense of, you know, any IQ to recognize that's the case, right? So um, has it exposed us to, you know, and I guess that's what I try to do in the book when I try to deal with Camus, right? But this is not a new problem, right? We've, we've, we've constantly relived these pandemics in crisis. Now, what the pandemic is, you know, I think like with all crises, the question to ask for me is, what is the, if we use the pandemic diagnostically, what does it show that was already broken in our society? Well, a great deal, right? We, we know of all the social inequalities, the racial inequalities, all the injustices, which the pandemic has made much more visible. And, you know, at the, at the level of just everyday raw realities of power, violence, death, the pandemic has exposed all those inequalities, right? Now, is there anything inevitable to the response of the pandemic? No, right? So could we have dealt with the global management of the pandemic differently? Yes. Did that require the hyper-accelerization of technology? Absolutely. Right? And I think for all the problems I have, with Giorgio Agamben's initial provocations on this, I think some of his warnings need to be heeded because I think Agamben has been correct in terms of warning about the ways in which this catastrophe, you know, it's like, is it any coincidence that the moment in the UK we started to celebrate this ridiculous thing called Freedom Day, Jeff Bezos sends himself out into outer space in the most phallic looking rocket that the world has ever known. Right, you know, th this is kind of a ridiculous world in which we are now in, and I think, you know, which I think requires some real serious philosophical self-reflection on the types of winners we are creating through the pandemic. And I think that's where I find, again, the post-humanist kind of fetishization sometimes of the technological and the connectivity to be opening a door actually to things which are very problematic as far as I see. Uh, I just I just have to clarify that I was not even proposing post-humanism as a redemptive philosophical structure. I don't I don't read, but I'm trying to address the problem that there is. That's it. Yeah. And, and and one one more point, like it's completely different from post-humanism, by the way. While you're thinking about the metaphysics of uh, the new, if, or if you if you think about a, a sort of a uh, response to the violence, the flow, the structure of violence, have you ever thought of uh, non-violence? In any by any chance, like something like from the Indian philosophical structure of, uh, but this seems to be a problem. Like Buddhism, the Buddhism as a philosophical system advocates some sort of non-violence, but we have this close neighbor to us, like Sri Lanka, where in which Buddhism itself becomes another violence upon the Tamil uh, minority over there. So this sort of violence, this sort of problems are there in the philosophical structure, but I was also having Gandhi in my in my mind when I talk about nonviolence, especially about the, the sort of sort of like uh, what he called ahimsa, like mm -hmm. no himsa, no himsa means no killing. This ahimsa, himsa is killing, so ahimsa. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was just curious. Yeah, but I think in terms of nonviolence, you know, going back to Jock's point about parasites, you know. 
if you study and teach violence and don't believe non-violence is, pro- is, is, is possible, then you're a parasite. You're parasitic to a problem you believe has no resolution. Right? And, and, I, and I think to me then, you know, and even worse, you might be profiting from a problem, which, or, you know, just be, be, be kind of stretch the thing. So do I think some conceptualization of non-violence is possible? Absolutely. Otherwise, why else study violence as a problem? Right? Now, certainly, you know, there's better authors writing on this than me, and, and I think in particular Todd May, and Todd May actually connects a lot to, you know, that particularly that Indian tradition, and particularly he's inspired by Gandhi. And I think Gandhi is, is such an important figure as well, and, you know, and I also think in terms of, I think there were the contemporary moments in contemporary politics, and the ways in which now, you know, in an age of a techno theodicy, how certain elements of the left are also becoming far more theological, in their own kind of moral absolutism. And I'm thinking also of like the, you know, the constant criticism that Gandhi now gets from certain quarters of the left, because you know, people can rightly point out that he benefited from a certain caste system in India. And but I think, you know, I think we're in a dangerous terrain in some of the leftist discourse today where everybody has to be so pure in who they are and who they embody, there's nobody left, right? You know, that you know, who are these people that we of course all humans are problems, we all have our poor flaws, we all say the wrong thing from time to time, we all send out a tweet we probably regret we ever sent it out, you know, or at least I've come off Twitter now, so that, you know, but I, I think that, you know, we, we have to be kind of mindful of, you know, of the shift to a new kind of puritanism that's happening on the left and the right in contemporary politics, which I find is very troubling, which is enabled by this new technologization, in which everything from the past is now a problem, and I think that that is also, I think, very problematic. So, uh, you told me, uh, do you do you have any response? No, the Chumei. You told me. Uh, response or question? The, anything is okay. So, uh, actually, the time is running up, so uh, we should actually, you know, get to the end. Yeah. Um, well, I was actually planning on asking about time. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Um, so um, in terms of, um, yeah, another question I had was over whether you can elaborate more about how you think about different notions of temporality. And I'm asking this because um, when you take up the issue of the sacred, you mentioned that the politics of the sacred have always been dependent upon the mastery of eschatological time. So I'm kind of taking that to mean that, right, when there is a vastness of future opening up, the present becomes insignificant. Mm -hmm. So this creates the dilemma about the meaningless of being human. Well, that might be more my take, but um, I was also thinking about how Arendt was identifying that for Kant's idea of history, there's three types of temporality. One is a biological time, another is a time of the human, and another of the species. And so there's a lot of thinking about religiosity and sense of time, um, but at the same time, right, um, for some religion, there's a beginning and an end, right? The, the moment of judgment is the end. And others, there's a beginning, but no end. And then others think about time as circular or oscillating. But in, um, yeah. Two pages later, um, he asked, in other words, do life and meaning, uh, what in other words, do life and meaning truly mean in the face of the anni- annihilation, especially from the perspective of those who are already dead and soon to be forgotten, regardless of what they brought to this world? So I was, yeah, I was wondering if you were thinking about temporality from the end and what that might mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, first point is, Time is the most important political concept we know. Mm-hmm. Right? So, and if we want to understand the real measure of power, privilege, just ask about a relationship to time. Right? Who has the luxury of time? Who has the privilege of time? You know, so time to me is by far the most important political concept we know. Right? Um, and you know, if we understand then this, you know, the platonic idea. That to philosophize is to learn how to die, which is something which kind of runs through Heidegger. So, um, again, I don't think that goes far enough, right? So, I um, temporality is so important for 
So I'll come back to that at that point at the end. So I'll end with that. But you talk about this idea, of course, you know, of um, the way in which ideas of the future can make the present insignificant. I think, you know, one of the things I've always taken from Walter Benjamin, and this was a point which was made explicit by Judith Butler in an essay she wrote on Benjamin, she says that Benjamin is the, is the, the theorist who asks the question, what time are we living? Right, so that is the question at the heart of Benjamin's thinking. What is the time in which we are living? Now, the time in which we are living in today is one in which actually the future and the present have collapsed. Right? The future is the present. Right? The, the, there is, you know, and this again is where Virilio becomes so important. Speed has conquered politics. Right? So we've sped up things to such an extent now that we don't, we're all now living in the future present where we demand answers now, right? That we, you know, 9-11 was a good example. You know, 9-11 happens, you know, Tony Blair says, this is the day the world changes forever. We go to war 18 days later. If it was truly the day the world changed forever, we should have spent three years really thinking about what it meant, right? Rather than, you know, going about our business as usual and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, we're in, we're, we're in an age today which is dominated by the tyranny of time and the tyranny of imminent time. So again, I'm thinking about Deleuze here, you know, Deleuze is, is one of the most important, if not the most important theorists of imminence. But Deleuze also said, you can only develop a theory of imminence if you've lived a little. <laughs> you know, Deleuze says you can't be a philosopher until you've grown old, right? And then you've actually got the experience to develop a theory of imminence. So I think that there is something there which has kind of got lost, which Virilio is, is, is on top of completely. Virilio understands this that speed has now conquered politics. And I think that we need to really keep hold of that idea then when we're thinking about the time in which we are living in today. It's an age in which speed has conquered politics. Now, the question then during the time kind of comes, you know, I think about, um, you know, my initial PhD was, you know, I think about like, for instance, a lot of kind of digitalized activism and so on today. When I studied my PhD, I went to Mexico and spent quite a bit of time with the Zapatistas in Chiapas. Their politics of time is a world away from the digital activism you see of the bourgeois left today. You know, for them, everything takes time. Everything requires, you know, a much more considered reflection. One of the things that we're sorely lacking in the world today is the time to reflect. You know, I've got no idea what it would mean to go to the director of research at my university and say, you know what, you know, Karl Marx had this great idea and it just took him 20 years to write this thing, right? How do you fancy if I come up with my next book in 20 years' time? We've got no opportunity to even think like that, even from one year to the next, let alone have that kind of time to really think through things. So I think, you know, but a more profound philosophical question, you know, which we get from Paul Salam. And this is why, to me, poets are so important. The poets of history are so important. Paul Salan teaches us, philosophy is not about learning how to die. It's to look upon life as if we are already dead. What does it mean to cross over into the other side? What philosophers might call the void. You know, the void is not the end of time. We are thrown constantly into the void. The void can appear at any given moment within time. Samuel Beckett understands this, Dante understands this, all the great poets of history understand this. The void opens up a rupture in time. You know, and I, I think that, that, you know, there's, um, you know, Walter Benjamin had this fascination with vortexes, right? And the vortex is a rupture in time. You know, some of the ex most exciting stuff, I think, in physics and Stephen Hawking is, you know, black hole phenomenon, these ruptures in time. I think that, you know, this to look upon life as if we're already dead, I think it might allow us to develop a new ethics for the living, rather than just simply this kind of being towards death, which you didn't see it too great, too much of during the pandemic, to be honest with you. So I, th I think there's, you know, this recognition of as if we're already dead might be a different, you know, or as Cornell West said, you know, start with the corpse. Then we might think about what politics looks like. Yeah. All right, so Tumay, do you have the more comment? I'm still thinking about liberalism. I mean, if I can use a biological metaphor, it almost feels like a bad ancient gene, you know, 
that is so diffusive and so penetrating. It gets everything. It gets socialism, Marxism, best feminism, animal right, or animal liberation, ecological movement. It just get into that. And it's, it's all like ne Neanderthal gene that it's been there for so long and it, it, it goes everywhere and it reach a point of equilibrium in the system that it is not decreasing anymore. I mean, like every one of us has some, some bad gene of liberalism inside us. And I, it got that to the point that I don't know how we can do with that to really, is it possible that we can really get rid of it or if not, then how do we do to transform it into something not that bad? <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm kind of thinking you know, um, Paul Virilio's point again about, you know, we have this, this relationship with technology all wrong that we produce the technologies and then kind of we'll try to work out the ethics rather than starting with the ethics and say do we actually need this stuff now a technology which would actually be able to extract the liberal gene however i'd all be in favor right? so if we could devise a technology that could extract out that kind of the liberal virus as you'd say i think i mean i'd agree with you know but i think on a, on a, on a serious point i think you know there's um i did actually um as part of the Los Angeles Review of Books series I did, which um, Alex also featured in, there was an interview I did with James Martell, and I, I really liked James's work, and you know, one of the, I think one of the better Walter Benjamin scholars as well. Mm -hmm. And James talks about contemporary fascism, and what James says is that fascism is not too dissimilar to liberalism. Mm -hmm. right? They they both actually behave in a very parasitic way. They both, as you say, they have this kind of tentacle reach, and the thing about it is the reason why it becomes so mutable. We know fascism in the 21st century is very different to 20th century fascism. The way in which it's able to adapt. The same in which liberalism is also able to adapt in a way in which, you know, it's, and this is why it can always kind of get itself off the hook. It's like, well, actually liberalism today is different from that liberalism. It's because it's able to colonize. It's been able to appropriate. It's been able to, you know, and still make you believe in it as much as fascism still gets people to believe in it, you know, and, and I think that's where Wilhelm Reich is, is, is correct. You know, they're, they both desire initiatives. They make you desire their oppressions, as though it, you know, to invoke Spinoza, you know, how do we desire our oppression as though it were our liberation, mm -hmm. right? So I think that there's something in that, so I, I agree with you, but um, how do we defeat liberalism like, like we defeat God, right? We just say liberalism is dead. Right. Mm. And just watch the liberals get angry and then just carry on, you know, and imagine in a new politics. I'm tired of writing about liberalism. So if we all start, you know, our discussion by just saying, no, I don't want to discuss it. Liberalism is dead. Right? Then maybe it'll go away like a bad smell or something. I don't know. Yeah, I think actually the rise of populism, you know, marked uh, the quite different situation, you know, from that to what liberal, liberal mm. actually imagined. I think uh, that's what we... I. Actually, in the new situation, I think uh, yeah, I agree that I agree. You know that your argument, you know, the post-liberal, you know, and uh, politics, and uh, we need actually you know another actually you know the concept of uh, void or something. You know, void is quite ontological. You know, event. So uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, I, yeah. I also think that the void to me is also so important because the void doesn't belong to the West. <laughs> and actually, there's a great deal of rich history, particularly in Asian philosophies, and you, you can probably teach me more about this, but in terms of the way in which they've dealt with the void artistically and aesthetically and historically. And I think actually the void is something in terms of ancient Latin American civilizations. They also have their own theorizations on it. And if we can kind of say, well, okay, how do we understand this innate human fear toward absence and nothingness? That can be the start point for a new perhaps metaphysics in the 21st century. Something which takes us out of the dominance of the European paradigm. The void, you know, the void. Europe has never wanted to deal with the void, right? Even Sartre as being a nothingness, he doesn't want to talk about the void. Right? So I think that actually the void to me is something which is a territorial and might be the start point for a truly multi-species mm -hmm. conversation. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then all right, for me, that, that is kind of, you know, the idea, anyway. 
So, all right, just I think time is running up already. We are at, you know, the 50 past 10 in Korean and the Japanese, Japanese standard time. So, uh, okay, just I think, you know, the today quite productive discussion, you know, not only actually over your book, but also the actually the Brad Evans is kind theorist. So uh, I think uh, very um, the happy to have you here and then very honored. And then, you know, we have, uh, um, the, you know, another time, you know, for uh, more discussion. And then we actually should you know, preserve more questions, you know, for the future. All right, thank you very much. It's been most enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah, speaking of the techno field, it'd be better to do it in person someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should actually do that. And then we will actually uh, see in person, you know, sooner or later. And then after this pandemic, I hope. Okay, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Until sir. then. Thank you. Bye-bye.